We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Modrovix. Joining me today is Martin Armstrong, hedge fund manager, international advisor, and author. How are you today, Martin? Good. How are you doing? Excellent. It's great to have you back. And, you know, I'd like to kind of start by really digging into all of the the cycle work that you do. You know, after analyzing the interest rate cycle many years ago at different points in history, sometimes it was bullish, let's say, to raise interest rates, while other times it was viewed as bearish. Is this a perfect example to illustrate how you came to the economic confidence model that you built? Yeah, I mean, I was doing research and, you know, the the only real research you can do is go through the old newspapers to really see what people were talking about back then. Uh, and I found it curious, like going into 1929, that they were raising interest rates and it was bullish. They were saying that proved people were still interested in borrowing. Uh, whereas the Great Depression, uh, they started lowering interest rates from back then it was six percent to uh, to one, and it didn't matter. Uh, um, <clears throat> and it makes sense. And 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 studying all the different booms and busts uh, <clears throat> in 1899, the the highest interest rate in the United States reached 200 percent. And, um, you know, I, I've published charts on the call money rate from New York, New York Stock Exchange. And it, they've been, you know, the stock market's never peaked with the same level of interest rates twice. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason for this is what I finally realized is that it's <clears throat> the expectation that counts. So if you think the stock market will double, um, in three months, you'll pay 20% interest. Uh, but if you don't think it's gonna go up 1%, you won't borrow 1%. Um, so it, it's really expectation. Uh, and every type of inflation wave is different. Uh, this one, they can keep raising interest rates all they want and it will only make it worse. Why? Because this is based on shortages. Mm -hmm. uh, and not, you know, speculative boom. You know, it, it, you, you have to understand that some of these theories developed from World War One and the Great Depression and World War II. Uh, <clears throat> in World War One, it was the big commodity boom. Um, the, the guy who became the richest man perhaps ever in history was Ogden Armour. Uh, armor meat company, hot dogs, etc. He supplied all the food during World War I to all the allies. And when it crashed after 1919, uh, back then he lost the equivalent of a uh, million dollars a day for 130 days straight. Uh, and uh, I had read his uh, uh, an interview that was in the Wall Street Journal. He was living, he, he lost absolutely everything, he was living off the charity of friends in London. And they asked him, uh, you know, how did it feel to lo lose that much? I mean, <clears throat> 130, you know, back then, million in 1919 was is like a trillionaire today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, none of them have ever reached that level. All right. And he said he knew uh, that he'd always be remembered for losing more money than anybody in history. <laughs> um, but so they developed this idea that raising interest rates to stop inflation because it was a speculative boom in 1919. Um, and so they tried raising the interest rates into 1929 and it had no effect. The market kept going up. So 
in 1929, what was different was that all the, the European capital came to America and they were all investing in uh, the auto stocks, which was kind of like the dot-com bubble back then, you know? Um, so it attracted all the, the uh, international capital. Everybody wanted to get, oh, the, these new fangled, you know, objects here. Um, <clears throat> and so this time we have shortages in commodities. So raising interest rates are not going to do anything. Uh, they're not going to suddenly make it rain uh, and you're going to have more wheat or, or anything of this nature. Um, so then you have somebody like, you know, Biden running around and trying to blame everything on Putin. And yeah, I think Putin even came out and says, now they even named inflation after me, you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, they don't want to admit what they have done. I mean, it, it was the lockdowns that started the whole uh collapse in, in the supply chain. I mean, I was getting emails from farmers that had to kill like 30,000 chickens because there were no truckers. They couldn't take them to market. Mm -hmm. uh, another one sent me a video. He plowed a, a mountain of potatoes and buried them because he couldn't get them to market. Uh, so you ended up with shortages. A lot of farmers uh, lost a lot of money and you had small businesses that, that lost. I mean, my former uh, assistant, she had uh, got married with a guy and they had just opened up a, you know, like a health spa in Philadelphia, maybe about two or three months before the, the lockdown started and they lost everything. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just, you know, they, there's no understanding of what is happening. These politicians they're like a, a horse in Central Park with the blinders on them. All they see is what's immediately in front of their nose. And I mean, this is, is a major crisis. Uh, you, you take Europe, they lowered interest rates to negative in 2014. But simultaneously, they had previously passed laws that uh, to be conservative, pe pension funds had to buy government bonds. So here we are in 2022, they're just now starting to look at raising interest rates. Yet these pension funds have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. They needed to make 8% you know, annually just to break even. Uh, so they don't look at these things. They say, oh, we'll stimulate the economy, we'll make it negative. And, and it never happened. All right, so they kept, they left it there. Mm -hmm. And so now you wiped out the pension funds uh, and so now they have a real major financial crisis on the horizon. It, it's, it's, I've never seen, I, honestly, in more than 40 years of dealing with governments around the world, I've never seen a crop of world pot leaders as complete idiots that we have today. And it's, I'm not talking about just Biden. I mean, you just look at Trudeau in Canada. You, then you look at, you just keep going. Macron, you know, the 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 Greens in 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 uh, Germany and Austria. Um, it, it's it's nuts. It's just completely nuts. Mm -hmm. If we think about, let's say, as ascribing malice instead of stupidity, does that really fit the? outcome or the the behavior of of the politicians a lot better uh in some cases uh, with the climate change yes um uh, i mean <clears throat> i i've had conversations and argued as that you you know if people are out of your minds i mean they they <clears throat> the greens have have suddenly got this power and they want to completely shut down fossil fuels now before there is any alternative really up and running. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't think they have any comprehension of what they're really doing. Uh, so is it, are, are they all knowing? No, I, mean, I think this is a lot of it. It's just absolutely stupidity. Um, and, and then they judge the world by themselves. So here in in North America, um, all right, you know, we're not that devastated. 
but look at Pakistan, all right? There's a revolution there in third world countries. You take energy up and people are living hand to mouth. Mm -hmm. They lost, they lose everything. So you ended up with a revolution. Um, you'll see more of that in third world countries and eventually will spread to the major countries. Mm -hmm. You know, when we keep thinking about how governments are exerting this control on, let's say, whether it's economy or society or whatever, is this ultimately an error? And does the business cycle or, you know, let's say power cycle ultimately re-exert its cyclical nature? Yeah, I mean, it's, I had, th there's just certain things, I think it takes a certain amount of time for the, uh, econ everything is driven by economics. Uh, you will, People will vote based upon their personal opinion or, or, or their experience. Uh, in 1985, I took the, the back page of The Economist in London and announced that, okay, fine, we're shifting from a public wave to a private wave. Uh, and these things are 51.6 years in duration. And the turning point was 1985.65. Uh, um, so just calculating pi out from that and I said, okay, fine, that will be the first time in this cycle, historically, you get a political change. That's when we could possibly see the first third type party president come to power. That, you know, you add that out to 1985.65 and it was 2017.05, uh, the very exact day that uh, Donald Trump was sworn in. And I went down to, to Washington and you have to understand people are going to look at these things in their own self-interest. They were all, oh, saying this is, uh, it's a fluke. Uh, and I said, no, it's not a fluke. You don't understand. It was a vote against you. Mm -hmm. Not that Trump was this wonderful guy on a white horse, etc. He was a non-politician. All right. So, uh, Actually, Putin was received, uh, you know, a 75 percent approval rating for the very same reason. Yeltsin turned uh, to Putin, who was an unknown at the time. Uh, you had the oligarchs on one side, Barisnovsky, et cetera, trying to take the, the government. And on the other side, you had the communists uh, trying to reassert. And so Putin was the he was not affiliated with any political party. He stood and he wasn't an oligarch. So Yeltsin turned to him and it was the same thing. And everybody cheered. The, the Russian people cheered because he wasn't a politician. So it was the same, you know, maybe motivation there behind it and at, at, at that stage. And um, then you saw people like John Kerry uh, after that, uh, when <clears throat> when Trump was elected, suddenly democracy became populism. Is this evil populism? <laughs> um, at, at Davos, they were uh, all in a state of panic because they suddenly realized they were all career politicians that could possibly happen to them. So that's really where this great reset began to take form. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like, if you look at Schwab's eight points in there is that democracy will come to an end, but we'll we'll retain, um, you know, your human rights and things of this nature. Uh, but that is for it, his selling point was for government. You don't want somebody like Trump, you know, coming to power in your country and you're thrown out on the street. Um, so they they hate they really hate democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, here in North America, we don't look at it uh, close enough. Just, but just, you know, look at how Schwab helped to uh, shape the EU. Um, the only people you vote for is, is a member of parliament. Parliament has no right, no power to overrule the European Commission. The European Commission is appointed. They never stand for election. The head of the EU, she never stands for election. 
she's appointed by the other heads. Okay. And it's actually the, the same type of political system that's in Russia is that they, they say, oh, you know, Putin, this is not democracy. It's an all, you know, to crock. It, it's exactly the same thing. The members of Duma voted for the for the head. Okay, fine. He had to be approved. Uh, this is what they do in Europe, mm. you know. But suddenly, Europe is somehow different than Russia. You know, um, it's not authoritarian when it is. Um, if, if you're a European and you and you are really fed up with uh, the head of the EU, she never stands for election, so you can't even vote her out. Um, this is what they would like to do here in North America as well. Eliminate uh, our right to vote and make us think that we got, we still have it. You vote for, you know, the street cleaner and stuff like that. Um, that's about it. You, it's just local elections. I mean, this is really what their end goal is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to your point, it, I think it really matters who's determining, as you said earlier, Martin, the, who's you know, retaining our quote unquote human rights. Well, if, if Klaus Schwab, you know, is the one determining what our rights should be about owning nothing and be happy, being happy with that seems like not a good future that I'm interested in. Well, even that saying, you have to understand that, uh, you have to look behind the words carefully of when a politician speaks mm -hmm. And what he's really saying that you'll own nothing and be happy is he's trying to make it sound like um, we're doing this for you. Mm -hmm. When in fact, the governments can no longer fund themselves. The whole debt bubble is coming. They know they're going to default. So if the government's defaulted and then wipes out all the pension funds, so then what happens? You're going to have millions of people with pitchforks storming the parliaments over mm -hmm. there. Uh, so what they're really doing is saying, oh, we're going to, you're burdened by all your student loans, your car loans, your mortgage, all this stuff. We're going to help you. We're going to eliminate all debt. All right. But in the process, they're defaulting on theirs. Mm. So it, 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 it's a, it's a shell game. They're trying to just make it sound like I'm doing it for you. Mm. This is, I only care about you, not myself, you know, um, so, Martin, there, there's another another piece that I wanted to touch on as well. You know, I did a podcast with a listener from Russia, and we were talking about at the time that Putin's approval rating, as you mentioned, was 75%. I think at the time I did that that interview, it was 71%. What error rating, or or do you think that that is relatively accurate? It's uh, no very accurate. I mean mm -hmm. it. The problem is that you you know you have Biden putting on these sanctions and things of this nature. Uh, you're publicly uh, waging war against the the Russian people. This idea is that oh we'll make it so bad for the people and they'll overthrow Putin. Sanctions have never worked. They've had sanctions on Iran. I mean, I think the Ayatollah is still there. Um, they have never worked, you know, in history even once. Uh, but it's the idea is that they will overthrow their government. So now mm. what you've done is you've shown that you're the enemy, not Putin. Mm. So Putin is basically, you know, putting Russia first, you know, so his his polls are real. Um, and, you know, we have to understand this, the same thing in, in, in Hungary that, you know, he had, uh, his polls were also in the seventies mm -hmm. because I mean, you, you have, when you have this stark view, uh, and, uh, of, and people understand what's going on, uh, then they're going to, they're really going to choose sides. Like in Austria, bringing in all these people from the Middle East, they're not assimilating. So they, they've divided the country. And uh, the same thing in, in Sweden, there are places you just can't walk. Uh, I mean, this has never happened before. Mm -hmm. So um, 
that whole idea of bringing them in and that will help the pension funds because the birth rates are declining and we need more population. Well, they're not assimilating the way um, Europeans did in, in, in North America. Yeah. Um, so it, it's a different religion. Um, you know, the, Germany, you can even Google it. I mean, Germany ended up having to put out a booklet like, uh, uh, you know, you don't touch women, you know, <laughs> um, in, if, in, <clears throat> if you went to like Saudi Arabia with your wife, she had to wear a scarf. All right. If, if she went in, in a, in a short skirt, oh my God, you know, I mean, if she went out by herself, she would be arrested because it's assumption that she's like a prostitute. Um, this is just religion in certain places, you know, uh, and I've done, have a lot of, of, of uh, Muslim friends. We have Muslims that work in our company mm -hmm. and, and people don't realize it's kind of like the difference between, um, I, I would say the Catholics and the Protestants, like in, in Ireland, mm -hmm. uh, there are very stark differences. And you have that between uh, Sunni and Shiite. Uh, Shiite basically believe that the uh, Ayatollah should be running the state. All right. Whereas <clears throat> Sunni, they don't believe that. Um, so you go to certain, you know, that's why Saudi Arabia is against Iran. Saudi Arabia has kinks. Iran doesn't think that's that's right. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, you, I was basically told that one, you know, basically they they follow Mohammed's brother-in-law, and the other one follows Mohammed. So, um, you have to understand that there are different cultures, in, in even within every religion. Mm -hmm. And some, the, you know, the woman's got to be completely covered in a burqa and others, they don't. It's, uh, it's, you go to Turkey and you see, you know, Islamic girls, but they're dressed like Western, you know, it's, it's, so it all depends where you're at. Mm -hmm. Martin, you know, I, I want to get back to a question around trying to be objective about looking at data, you know, when looking back at history with this, with this objective view, you've come up with a different explanation for hyperinflation other than central banks printing or borrowing the currency into oblivion. If we take, for example, you know, hyperinflations throughout history as the examples, what really changes consumer confidence in the currency and government that results in the ensuing hyperinflation? Well, um, Unfortunately, most of the hyperinflations like Germany have been, just been um, casually reported and, and they, oh, you know, it's, it was the printing of the money that caused it. And, and that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. you, you have to dig um, a little bit deeper. And in, in, it was December 1929 or, or 1922 when... Um, they couldn't pay the reparation payments, uh, which were onerous. And even Keynes had said, this is, you know, uh, you shouldn't do this, etc." cetera. Um, so Germany did a, um, the Weimar Republic at the time, did a forced loan. They took, confiscated 10% of everybody's assets and they gave you one of these bonds, okay? And you can get them on eBay, they're not that expensive. <laughs> because uh, they defaulted on them. But um, once you confiscated 10% of everybody's uh, assets, the cash in the banks, uh, then people basically bought every other foreign currency they could or tangible items or, or so it wasn't even just gold. It was uh, art went up. Uh, in fact, when the hyperinflation collapsed, finally, and they issued a new um, a currency that was 1925, and you can buy those notes on eBay, as, you know, as well. And they were backed by real estate because mm -hmm. they didn't have any gold. Uh, so th the hyperinflation came because the the government seized 10 percent of everybody's assets. That collapsed the confidence in in the Weimar Republic. People took whatever money they had out. Uh, <clears throat> 
And so there was no like taxation coming in and they just started printing money to, to cover everything. Mm. So it it's, you don't see them printing money just for the sake of printing money. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it has to do with usually that is, is the result of some, you know, something that's happened. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in Zimbabwe or any of these things. You hungry, went through it. Um, it's a collapse in the confidence. Uh, you know, I've, I've re created the monetary system of Rome. And um, we all know that Rome fell. But my question was, how did it fall? Was it like a 747 coming gradually in for a landing or was it like a waterfall? Mm -hmm. So I, I collected the coins and the Romans were uh, great, uh, I would say, secretaries, so to speak. Uh, the emperors <clears throat> uh, wanted to pretend that it was still a republic. So they the coins are actually dated. Uh, I was consul for the year number one, number two, number three. So you know what year um, in his his reign it was issued. Because mm -hmm. a consul was appointed during the Republican period for one year. So he would renew that power every year on his coins. So, I mean, of course, it's like the EU today. There's no real election, <laughs> right? Uh, but uh, so you can actually date the coins. Uh, and that's how we have actually validated a lot of things from history. But um, <clears throat> we have, uh, I put it together and, and I had the coins tested for the metal content. And lo and behold, the, the collapse of Rome the monetary system took place only in eight years. What caused it? Uh, <clears throat> there was a, an Emperor Valerian I, and he was captured in battle by the Persians. This is the first emperor ever taken prisoner. All right, so, uh, and then his son, Galenus, didn't have the power to go rescue him. So it, it would be more like uh, Biden went to Russia to go visit uh, <clears throat> Putin and he put him in jail and say, yeah, come get him. And we couldn't. Uh, I mean, kind of like that. So suddenly the confidence in, in the Roman Empire was shaken right to the foundation. It's the first emperor that's been, been captured. Uh, people started hoarding money. They didn't trust banks. So then to to meet, uh, make ends meet, they started debasing the currency dramatically. Uh, that's when the barbarians from up north said, gee, the Persians got away with it. Maybe we should try it too. So then they started invading. So the whole confidence in the Roman Empire just collapsed. Uh, and, and then you start seeing separatist movements take place. Um, <clears throat> The, there was the Gallic Empire that split off, uh, which was basically France, uh, Britain, and Spain, because they felt Rome could never defend them anymore. So they split off, not that they wanted to uh, conquer Rome, but they split off uh, to defend themselves. So you see the same natural human responses. Uh, and so that's what you have to, to understand. Um, people that look at just creating more money have been wrong. Uh, it has not produced hyperinflation in the United States. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of those theories go back really to, to the uh, 14th and to, I would say, the 16th century. Uh, there wasn't a... Um, a financial capital per se. Uh, the, the money was all coins and they traded on the exchange in Amsterdam based upon the metal content. So that was the foreign exchange rate. Um, and it really wasn't until after that period that we start to see um, through trade uh, and, you know, 
coming into the United States, America, you know, Spain then rises uh, and comes back with all this gold. So then it, it passes off to the Dutch. The, then from the Dutch, the English took it, you know. So <clears throat> you see these, um, the currency of the financial capital of the world is always the one that's dominate. Um, so you, you have uh, China issuing uh, debt in British pounds up to 19, you know, 14. Uh, just as emerging markets today issue debt in dollars. Uh, so, you know, it's <clears throat> because that's where all the capital is. If I want to sell my debt, I'll, I'll issue it in dollars and that makes it easier to sell. Mm -hmm. So because of that, does global debt really matter at this point anymore? Um, the problem with debt is that um, it, it is, it's really changed in its function. It, under Brenton Woods, I mean, if you had a hundred dollar e-bond from the U.S. and you went down to the bank and you'd say, gee, I want to borrow on this. Um, can you give me $80? It was illegal. All right. You had to cash it in if you wanted the money. Um, after Bretton Woods, everything changed. So if you want to trade futures, you post T-bills as collateral. All right. So now debt has just become currency that pays interest. Whereas before the theory was if you borrowed, it was less inflationary because you couldn't use it. It wasn't collateral. So you weren't increasing the money supply. I mean, that was the theory. But today, uh, people blame central banks, which is really kind of absurd because the central bank can't control the fiscal side. <clears throat> and they just issue print whatever they want to print uh, and it, issue it as debt. And that debt becomes cash that pays interest. That's it. Uh, so, it, you know, the, the banks put up reserves uh, with the Federal Reserve or, or Central Bank. And what do they do? They post government bonds. Uh, so it's it's the debt is 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 just currency and at this at this stage. Um, and that's what Europe has failed to understand. So when they went to negative interest rates, they destroyed their bond market. Nobody will really buy them. So the central bank has to buy everything that that's really coming out. Um, and pension funds not going to say, yeah, gee, okay, fine. Give me uh, 10 years worth of negative bonds. You know, mm -hmm. uh, they're losing money at, at anything below 8% to begin with. So it, it's the debt crisis that we have is really being promoted by Europe because going to these negative, they wiped out their bond market. And uh, that was really reflected here uh, in the <clears throat> why Citibank stopped, uh, withdrew from the uh, uh, repo market in August 2019. And the Fed had to step in. And why? Because they would no longer uh, accept European bonds as collateral. Um, I, I talked to some of the top banks in New York. They will not accept a German bond, French bond, anything. Okay, fine. Can I borrow against this? No, thank you. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. So that's why the Fed stepped into the repo market because the U.S. banks are going, well, you know, when Merkel stood up and said, if Deutsche Bank fails, we're not going to bail it out, then why would you take its paper? It's too great of a risk. Mm -hmm. That was really behind the, the, uh, the whole repo crisis, and that was in August. And then I believe that, you know, the COVID uh, thing was all manufactured as well. Um, as I, I do know the, that <clears throat> I was hearing rumors that a virus was coming um, August, September of 2019. I know Klaus Schwab even was telling friends, uh, be careful, a virus is coming. And that was by January. Uh, um, 
So, you know, then you get the crash. Bill Gates had started selling his stock out in, in December 19. And this is, I think it was an exercise largely in pushing this authoritarian agenda, this great reset. Mm-hmm. Because then immediately, within weeks, they were saying, oh, you know, uh, it, <clears throat> we get build back better and all this other kind of stuff um, that was coming out. So uh, it, yeah. you didn't come up with a plan, build back better within, you know, within one week. <laughs> Um, but they had everything ready to go. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 it's the debt crisis that's causing that. They, they know this cannot go on. And that's what the Ukrainian war is about. Uh, it's um, the excuse to print money to, now to defend ourselves. Does this mean that, you know, basically the road ahead lies MMT and, and UBI as the, the next probable outcomes? Um, th- there's a, a lot of, I would say, uh, resistance towards the, the new monetary uh, theory. But um, I think there's just too many academics that are on board with with Schwab and they think that this is the solution it, it's to to get out of this debt crisis that we have a, a sovereign debt crisis is is to do this and uh, the, the difference here and why I say they're they're going to fail is that um, Marx's idea made more sense uh, at the time in Russia because uh, Russia didn't eliminate serfdom until 1861. Then all of a sudden you had all these people uh, free, very nice, but they own nothing. They couldn't even grow their own food. So, you know, this Marxist idea, oh, let's go get the rich. Yeah, okay, fine. They own everything and we can't get it. Uh, made more sense. Um, today, people have a car, their house, whatever. Oh, you'll own nothing and be happy. It doesn't ring very loud today as it did back then. It's a completely different set of circumstances. So uh, I think they have misunderstood that. But again, they're academics that don't look deeply. They just take the superficial idea. You mentioned the the current conflict in Ukraine. Does Socrates predict that there will be heavier conflict before a resolution or that maybe China gets involved by going after Taiwan here? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, it's. um, You have to understand that. To pull off this great reset, they had three targets. They had to get rid of Trump because he stand in the way of climate change. Uh, the climate change agenda is mainly to create the one world government with the UN uh, at the head of it. You see it also, you're using it with the WHO and stuff like this, um, that it takes a central government to, to, uh, to defend the entire planet. Uh, th- this is this, you know, the sales pitch. Um, then they had to get rid of Putin. Uh, and they have to get rid of Jane. And then they think they can they can conquer the entire, entire world and put the UN as the head. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's a stupid decision, you know, theory, but this is what they're really trying. So if you look at Ukraine, um, on February 20th, the U.S. sent Harris over to this Munich meeting. Now, at the very least, they should have sent the Secretary of State, all right, not the VP. And so she's just really, honestly, an idiot. Uh, and so somebody, you know, gave her a slip and said, oh, you should say Ukraine should join NATO, which was a violation of the Belgrade Agreement. Now, most people don't realize, but when the Soviet Union collapsed in 91. 
Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power in the world. It had more nukes than China. So the negotiation was they gave up those nukes. Russia took them back. NATO promised not to go in and Russia promised not to go in provided they remain neutral. Mm -hmm. So her blurting out, you know, oh, you know, Ukraine should should join NATO was a violation of that. Then you can Google, uh, I think it was the Daily Wire reported on February 23rd, uh, just three days later, Zelensky is up there saying that, uh, oh, we're going to reestablish nuclear weapons uh, to defend against Russia. Putin then moved in the next day. Now, um, you know, all the propaganda against Putin and Ukraine, <clears throat> that's what it is. Because if you're going to invade a, a, and conquer a country, all right, the standard military operation as we did in Iraq, you, you take out the power grid, you take out the communications, and you take out the water. All right. Uh, he did none of that. All right. All these world leaders, uh, Biden's wife even goes to, to Kiev. Uh, oh, it's a war zone. It's not a war zone. Otherwise, if it was, why would all these world leaders be going there? They know Putin's just protecting the Donbass. That's it. Mm. Um, so it's all propaganda. Uh, and people don't even understand what the history of the area is. Uh, Ukraine was never a nation prior to the Soviet Union. It was Ukraine uh, means borderland. Uh, it was owned at time by Lithuania, you know, Poland. It was always going back and forth. Um, and Kiev is on the river. The other side of the river east was the Russian Empire before uh, the USSR. And most people don't realize that uh, Khrushchev grew up there in the Donbass. All right, not in Moscow. He grew up there. And when after World War II, he was put in charge of Kiev to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. So when he became the, the leader of Russia in 1954, he's the one that took Crimea and assigned it to, get to Kiev to be managed. All right. It wasn't Ukrainian territory. Um, neither was the East. So that's why the Donbass has all these Russian people. It was, was Russia before. All right. And so it, you know, all this thing, uh, you know, Zelensky, oh, we're not going to give up one inch. That was a border written by um, Khrushchev. You know, it wasn't your territory. The Ukrainians don't even live there. Mm. Um, so it would be more or less like uh, Mexico trying to say, well, Texas was ours before. So we're just going to take this, you know, and we'll, you know, it. you have to look at this stuff a little bit more you know, deeply. Mm -hmm. And in, in Russia, the ironic thing here is that um, they, the scholars there have had a long-term debate. Um, who is really Russian? And, and, and because Khrushchev was basically from the Donbass region, you could technically say that it was Ukrainian. You had, um, Stalin, all right, who was one of the most ruthless people ever, he was from Georgia. All right, so um, it, it's ironic that in Georgia they hate Russians, but they hate them because their own guy is the one that oppressed their own country. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a long term debate as to who's really Russian, and because it was like the United States, a guy from California becomes president or or Louisiana or whatever. Uh, that's how the USSR was. Uh, and so they weren't all heads of state from Moscow. Mm -hmm. Martin, is it is it possible that Putin 
is in some ways standing up for Europe and against the the Davos crowd, you know, seeing what their agenda is? Oh, yes. I mean, it, 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 you can Google just um, Soros. I mean, he's been covered in, in Epic Times and a number of newspapers coming out saying that Putin and Jing are, uh, are threats to civilization. I mean, oh, you know, his idea of civilization is a one world government or the UN. So he they are promoting the overthrow of Putin and China uh, so they can create their little, you know, backyard, you know, fantasy land. And, and the problem here is that Putin is standing up to this and so Jing. Uh, and it's it's so stupid it's it's crazy um fine they got rid of trump and they put in somebody that wouldn't you know it's just going to drool over the paper and sign whatever they stick in front of them um you know it it's really debatable you know what what the heck is going on here but it, it's i our computer does not show any way shape or form that they are going to succeed uh, we're heading more into World War III after 2024. And I'm more concerned about that period, um, although hostilities are going to increase sharply uh, from basically from this August, July, August, into uh, particularly early 2023. Um, you. And you have them, you know, trying to Lithuania trying to suddenly put in blockades, uh, things of this nature, and and Putin's come out and said, "You do that," and and you know, it's it's on. Um, so, twenty twenty four is not just Biden. Uh, you go down the list and you can see everybody that's up for reelection. Uh, it, Zelensky and uh, over there, Putin is up for election. Um, the head of the EU, um, it, it's it's a, a, a watershed year politically. Uh, so, uh, honestly, I mean, I have you know people I speak to in in Russia, and my you know all the propaganda is always against Putin. Putin is probably. The, mo the most reasonable guy that we have uh, among world leaders. His problem that is that he is nostalgic and a historian. Kiev is where Russia began. It was that was the first city of the Rus. The Mongols came in and destroyed it in 1240. So eventually. Um, they fled and was a, there was a country there briefly it was called uh, Galatia. And then, you know, the Poles destroyed that. And then eventually they rose again in Moscow. All right. So to, to uh, Putin, he did not want to like nuke Kiev. I mean, that that's like the fatherland to, to him. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other people behind him, if you look, they are often out there threatening nuclear war. All right. And my concern is you remove Putin, as they're saying, oh, you know, somebody should get rid of him. The next tier is much worse. Um, and so that's why I'm more concerned about 2024, is I'm not so sure Putin will uh, run again. But uh, whoever is going to be there after Putin is going to be 10 times worse. I mean, much more hardline. Um, even their secretary of state has, has acknowledged and publicly came out and says, look, this is a war of the United States against Russia. Uh, and that, uh, you know, the joke is that they'll fight to the last Ukrainian dies on the battlefield. Um, so that's it. I mean, they're circumventing everything. Um, Congress is the only one has the power to declare war, but they define war as sending troops. Okay, so he can send 
all the military 80 ones, uh, you know, whatever, uh, that's fine. So he can promote the war over there that way, but, uh, and prolong it. But uh, until you start sending the troops on the ground, that requires Congress. Mm -hmm. You you know, Martin, your model shows that 2032 is when that next great shift in the world could take place. Can you explain to us more about what that next, let's say 10 years could look like, or, or even if you want to take from 24 to 32? Well, it's going into that period. This is the collapse of, of the form of government that we know today, uh, which is basically republics. Um, a republic is where I can say, okay, fine, vote for me. I'll, I'll give you a lollipop and, and a free car or something. And then I get down to Washington. They go, okay, fine. That's very nice. Okay, this is the way you vote. Uh, um, you got to vote party line. So um, Republic is uh, is the worst form of government. I mean, even look at Zelensky. Uh, you can, you know, Google, you know, when he was elected on CNN. Uh, even the Russians were, were very hopeful with him. Because uh, he ran on a on a thing, he was going to end corruption, and he was going to seek peace with Russia, uh, and he's done exactly the opposite. Exactly. Uh, so, um, that's the problem with a republic. They 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 simply are representative. So they represent their own self-interest. Once they get there, I'll give you $10 million, vote for this. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, and, and, and that's what you, what you end up with. Uh, like I said, they should be like NASCAR drivers with a jacket with all the patches of everybody that's bribing them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think 2032 will be another collapse in our form of government, but this time it'll be... Uh, Republics, and hopefully we go um, to the third option, which will be more of a direct democracy. Um, we certainly have the technology today. You go online. Should we invade Ukraine? Yes or no? No. Okay, or yes, or whatever you want to say. Um, and there's no reason why we can't make that decision instead of somebody who's being bribed by you know everybody from Pfizer to you know normal you know to every arms dealer in the country. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I would be, you know, more inclined for that. The last time this happened uh, and uh, was the revolution, American revolution, which was against monarchy. Uh, And then the French did the same. Uh, So everybody stood up and started overthrowing their their monarchies. even in Britain, you know, the Queen still goes to Parliament, very nice, but she doesn't make the decisions on running the country. Um, so they kept her there as a symbol, but not, you know, actually doing anything. So I, I think that's what 2032 will be the um, turning point for our political type governments. And we get to redesign something else thereafter. And I'm hoping it will be direct democracy. but. I mean, Trump was elected because he was not a career politician. Uh, <clears throat> Putin was cheered because he was not an oligarch or a communist. Uh, we need, you know, I think that's what, you know, you look at people, what they're going to vote for, they're going to basically just overthrow the whole system. That's it. It's just too corrupt. Mm-hmm. Do you foresee central bank digital currencies becoming another form of control over this period? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's what they're pushing for. Um, They will just seize all the cryptocurrencies and you'll get, you know, one of these for two of those or whatever. Um, But again, you can Google the Bank of England um, and their proposal um, that they wanted to uh, include the power and, and the way they actually pitched it. I mean, it was, it was amazing, but oh, parents, you know, should be able to restrict the money they give their children 
so they can only buy lunch at a school rather than a chocolate bar. <laughs> so once you put that in there, uh, then the government can restrict whatever you, you spend your money on. Mm -hmm. So it's absolutely total control. Uh, I also think that honestly, that blockchain was created by the government. By um, I know they attribute to some Japanese guy or whatever. How come he has never come forward for all his royalties? Um, and, and if I give you a hundred dollar bill, they don't know where I got it from. Mm -hmm. But if I gave you a hundred, you know, in a cryptocurrency that's blockchain. They know exactly where I got it from and they can trace it all the way back. That's that's the ultimate taxation level period. Mm -hmm. uh, they get to know where everything was that you pay your taxes while, when you got it. If we look back, you know, taking, for example, tulipmania.com bubble, all of these different bubbles that we've seen. Do you think that the, the cryptocurrency bubble was one in the same of those types of cycles? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, um, they're based upon just a sales pitch that has no reality behind it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, at the time they were saying, oh, you know, Bitcoin is going to replace the dollar as reserve currency and, all, and it's outside the central bank. So you don't have this. Uh, um, you know, it, it restricted things. I mean, this is all very nice sales pitches, but it, it doesn't cut, you know, you're in the middle of uh, the Sahara Desert and you want a bottle of water. I don't think he's going to take a cryptocurrency. Um, and, and the same thing, the danger of those is, as I said, uh, Putin's not trying to uh, take Ukraine. Otherwise, he would have taken out the power grid the communications and the water supply. Mm -hmm. You do that on an invasion of a country, what good is your digital currency going to do you? You can't go get a bottle of milk. You can't go get anything. It's going to, in my view, it's going to be uh, back to tangible. I mean, it could even be a can of beans or something. Um, uh, and I think the biggest example of that in history, or I would say the most notorious, was actually Japan. Each emperor, what he did was he um, devalued all the outstanding coins to be worth only 10% of his new coins. Um, so after a couple of times of this, the Japanese refused to accept Japanese coins. They used China's coins and they use bags of rice for money. Uh, so what happened was uh, Japan actually lost the uh, ability to issue coins for 600 years. It wasn't until the Meiji uh, dynasty that coins were reintroduced mm -hmm. in the 19th century. So for 600 years, there's no Japanese coins. So that shows what we were talking about before, the confidence in government, it collapsed. That was probably the most extreme duration of 600 years uh, that I've ever seen. I mean, nobody else is going that far. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you could say it took 600 years for the reintroduction of gold coins in Europe after the fall of Rome. That's true. Um, but... Uh, you know, that's really what you're looking at. You know, another cycle that you and I spoke a bit about last time was the gold cycle. And you explained that the idea of going back to a gold standard isn't the solution to all of our problems from a monetary standpoint because of the cyclical nature of, of everything in the world. So can you give us some perspective on where we might be in the gold cycle? Um, well, gold will, will go up with the, because all tangible things are, are going to rise. But the problem with the gold standard or pegging a currency, uh, even like Switzerland pegged the, you know, the, the Swiss franc to the euro, uh, Bretton Woods, none of these things survive. Why? Because there is a business cycle. There are periods in time where food is plentiful and other times where it's in shortage. 
um, and you can't have um, money fixed at a standard value. Mm -hmm. um, Bretton Woods, they fixed, you know, gold at $35. All right, fine. At the time, maybe it made sense. But then over that period, um, you up until 1971, you had all these, uh, you know, you had Democrats coming in, vote for me and I'll give you this, I'll give you that or whatever. So you had socialism um, come in and that was based upon bribing people. So then you create more money uh, to hand out so you get elected, but you, you're you not creating gold to back the money. So suddenly the, the money supply far ex exceeds this tie to gold. And that's why Bretton Woods broke. But it the same thing happens with all pegs. Uh, Southeast Asia currencies, the 97 Asian crisis, uh, it will eventually happen with the Hong Kong peg to the dollar. Because what you're doing, as Hong Kong has pegged its currency to the, to the US dollar, we end up with um, rising inflation, raising interest rates. That is now being imported to Hong Kong. So interest rates are rising there versus in China. So you're, that's part of what these, you know, the problem with standards and uh, pegs create. It's, it's, you're importing or exporting the very same uh, economic conditions behind that currency. So when you say, Martin, that tangible assets will, you know, keep going up at this point do you mean you know gold silver real estate what are some of those tangible assets that oh, you have just in about everything i mean uh you see antiques uh ancient coins um uh, art stamps uh all these things are are are, are rising there was just like a mercedes gold wing that just sold for a couple of million bucks um what, wasn't it like 30 million or something like something that? Something like a couple, that. yeah. I mean, I mean, I remember, you know, being offered one for like, you know, $500,000, I mean, years ago. Um, but uh, it, it just ends up being crazy. I mean, uh, there are a few Roman gold coins of Brutus um, with his portrait on the front and the back. It has two daggers and a, and a cap, uh, and it says Ide Mar. He's bragging that he killed Caesar on the Ides of March. Um, the last one with a hole in it, no less, uh, just sold for 2.2 million. The previous sale was like 200 grand. I mean, I mean it, it gets to, to the point, it's just unbelievable advances and 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 in price i mean it's it's crazy mm. but it, it's across the board it so it's uh comic books you see the first edition of spider-man bringing uh, you know outrageous prices uh so it seems like uh i mean here in florida um houses are are going up quite sharply i know a local real estate guy and houses that are like um uh, one to three million he says they're they're selling for cash they're not mortgages he says everybody's coming in with cash deals so part of that is is parking money part of it is just trying to get away from the crazy states up north um but there is definitely a mass exodus from like california uh new york uh, connecticut um Pennsylvania, New Jersey, just, I think I've met more people from New Jersey down here when I, than I did when I was in New Jersey. <laughs> do, you, do you see that housing market really starting to cool off though with the rising interest rates and mortgage rates? Um, in certain price areas and in certain areas, yes. Mm -hmm. um, if you are in an area that um, you want to you should get out of like Chicago or something like that. I mean, you get out as soon as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, 
But then you look at, at states where people are going to and um, prices are still rising. Mm-hmm. And like I said, the, the higher price ones seem to be going up um, as even in cash deals. They're not, they could care less about the interest rate. Mm-hmm. Martin, something you and I kind of touched on a little bit before we hit record here this morning was, you know, how hard it is for the average person to get real info about what's going on in the world today. So how bad is, is censorship getting? I know, I believe it's today, there's a bill being introduced into Canadian parliament about censorship. How bad is the, the let's say, censorship or, or propaganda really in the world today? And how hard is it to find real information? It's very hard. It's getting... Um, I mean, most of the information I get is, is, is direct, really. Um, I can't imagine much of... of um, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this new book and I have the um, I, I, on one instance I put in the newspaper account of Yeltsin and Clinton meeting in Turkey, and it says, "Oh, you know, they're bashing each other." Blah blah blah. And then I have the the declassified phone call. Yes, yeah, I know. We got to take jabs at each other now and then. It's not, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Uh, it's it's all theater. It's just theater. That that's it. Um, and in the phone call, Yeltsin's going, "Look, you you're funding these terrorists. They're going into Chechnya. Bill, this is your fault." You know, I mean, they're not talking like enemies. Uh, um, and then you, but you read the newspapers like, oh, he bashed them, and they're they're like, you know, he's telling them they got to stop Chetnia and stuff. It, it's it's you know what is happening behind the scenes versus what's in the newspapers is completely different. Excellent, Martin. Well, I think that's a, a fairly good place to wrap up today's conversation. Is there anything you'd like to add before we do? Uh, no, I mean, um, it's. Uh, I hope to come out with a book very soon. Uh, I've got a hold of all the declassified documents from um, the Clinton administration uh, showing how Putin came to power. I mean, all this stuff is very, very interesting. It's completely different than anything you've seen in, in the uh, in the press or, or even in history books. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, of course, if our listeners want more from you, they can find you on Twitter at Strong Economics and ArmstrongEconomics.com as well, right? Yes. And you have a lot of a lot of excellent free articles on your on your blog there that you know covers a lot of the topics that we did here today. Yeah, we believe that uh, you can go in there that you don't have to register or anything of that nature. We try to keep it as an open forum. Um, and uh, uh, it's it, it's mainly there for a public service. Mm-hmm. Well, I really appreciate your time and, and sharing your opinion and your research with us here today, Martin. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.